All right, everybody. So welcome, welcome to our event. We are delighted to have you and your hairdos in our audience to learn more about the science behind the question, why care about hair? Before we get started, I would like to say thank you to today's speakers, thank you to the Leakey Foundation, and thank you to our special guest hosts. We join you today under the umbrella of the Leakey Foundation's mission to understand the science and evolution behind what it means to be human. Lucky for us, this topic is broad, like millions of years of history broad and plenty of angles and topics to explore broad. While today's topic is hair, tomorrow's could be how we move. And after that, why we eat what we eat or even how we form social bonds. And while many of those topics are rooted in the ancient, they're more relevant than ever to today's understanding of humanity. That's where the YPG, our young professional group, and the organizers of today's event come in. We're a group of young professionals united by our belief in the importance of the Leakey Foundation's mission, our passion and interest in its work, and our desire to share this connection with our peers to help secure its future. Our group organizes periodic events that bring this science to life for our peers, and like many these days, are doing so through virtual events. Today, we are thrilled to talk shop evolutionarily with Tina Lasisi, a biological anthropologist and PhD candidate and part of the Jablonski Human Evolution and Diversity Lab and the Shriver Anthropological Genomics Lab at Penn State University. Her research focuses on the evolution of human hair variation. We're also joined by Elizabeth Tapanes, an ev evolutionary biologist and PhD candidate at the George Washington University Center for the Advanced Study of Human Paleobiology, where she's part of the Primate Genomics Lab. Her research focuses on the evolution of hair in non-human primates. Many of the Leakey Foundation supporters of today discovered a passion for human origin science when they were young, and their interest was solidified by unique experiences and a strong community. The YPG looks to bring that to the next generation of supporters, which we hope are many of you in this crowd. So if you'd like to join us at the YPG, make sure you sign up. The registration will be sent in a follow-up email to all of who registered today. And if you saw on your registration, you can still get one of these sweet mustache masks and a hair vendor coffee with a small donation. So check your inboxes and check the chat during this event. Without further ado, I introduce to you Hannah Wood, fellow human origins enthusiast and Leaky Foundation supporter, who will be hosting today's discussion. If you have any questions during the event, please include them in the chat. Thanks for joining. All right, thanks Ria for that wonderful introduction. And I guess just get started. I see an incredible number of participants here today, which is wonderful. Thank you so much for joining. Put your hand up if you're wearing sweatpants. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, so without, you know, be, you know, further ado, I'm going to say I'm a big fan of Reddit. And one of my favorite subreddits is the explain to me like I'm five subreddit. So that's basically what I'm going to ask Liz and Tina to do. What questions, explain your research to me like I'm five. What questions are you trying to answer? Liz, why don't you kick us off here. Sure. Um, hi to everybody who came to hear me and Tina babble about hair a little bit. And thanks to the Leaky Foundation for hosting this. Um, so what questions am I trying to answer? So I'm interested essentially in why animals look the way that they do. And for non-human primates, you know, when you're, when you're looking straight at them, one of their most sort of diverse phenotypes are, is their hair. And I'm curious in why their hair has evolved to be so diverse. So some of them have mustaches and some of them have like these weird kind of patterns on their faces and also how that diversity evolved. So genetically speaking. That's so cool. And it's very interesting to consider that when we pose the same question to Tina. Tina, explain to me like I'm five. What questions are you trying to answer? 
Sure, Hannah. So hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, my research is in some ways typical anthropology in the sense that anthropologists tend to be self-centered because we ask, why are humans special? We think we're very special. And my particular angle on asking the question of why are we so special is to do with scalp hair. So if you think about it, like I do all the time, humans are really weird. And a lot of people have written about why we're weird because we're naked. But I would say that something that's even weirder than that is the fact that we're sort of naked because we still have scalp hair. You have a, not a lot, you have a number of mammals that are naked. We're in good company with whales, hippos, elephants kind of, um, but we are the only ones to my knowledge that have decided to do the whole naked body but hair on top. So most of my dissertation is trying to understand why that would be because generally, evolutionarily speaking, sometimes when you have a group of organisms that has something that no other organism really has, you kind of suspect that natural selection might have something to do with it. And then the second step to that is really asking, well, if we're so special and if this has been selected, then why is this one of our most variable traits? If you look at differences between populations, you'll notice really easily that the hair we have on our heads is one of the traits that varies the most among us. So that's pretty much my dissertation explained to a five-year-old. <laughs> I, appreciate, I appreciate you dumbing it down for me. I guess sort of to build on that, again, you know, from somebody who is an outsider to the hair scholarship community, um, you know, what is the scientific significance of your research? You know, sort of why, you know, not to be literal, but like, why should we care about what you're doing? And how does it sort of fit into the general sort of scientific field of evolution? I'll have Tina, why don't you go ahead and start okay. with us? And then <laughs> sure. Um, so what's kind of the most important thing about my research uh, to anthropologists is that it can help us understand human origins. So part of my question is about what role scalp hair might have played in terms of human origins. So a lot of the research about human origins asks questions about traits that we consider quintessentially human. Why did they evolve? Did they uh, release any constraints, so to speak. So for example, if one of the traits that makes us humans evolved, did it help other traits be evolvable? So when you're talking about hair, um, the big kind of factor that we're considering is thermoregulation. So if hair somehow was able to release a thermoregulatory constraint, so help us uh, stay cool, no pun intended, wow. I, I am ashamed of my puns. Um, <laughs> is it something that could have allowed us, so to speak, to grow these huge brains? Because one of the things about brains is that they are really thermosensitive. So if you think about heat stroke, really what you're worried about harming is your brain and what you need to protect is your brain. One way to do that if you are not um, blessed with hair is a hat, but if you are blessed with hair, <laughs> and I've found certain variants are better at it than others, that can be something that protects you. And so answering that question can also help us understand things in modern humans, like if this turns out to be something that actually plays a big role in thermoregulation, maybe we should be adjusting guidance in terms of protecting people from uh, solar radiation. And then the second part of that is uh, understanding what genes are involved in hair morphology. Um, if you wanna be really science fiction about it, uh, humans love to change themselves. So you know what, maybe we'll figure out how to crisper a different hairstyle for you. Uh, we're not there yet, but maybe in the near future. That's cool. And I'm really interested now having posed that question to you and got such a fascinating answer. You know, we'll go to Liz and say, what is the scientific significance of your research? You know, why should we care? And how does it fit into human evolution when you're not studying humans really at all? 
Yeah. First, I just have to say, Tina, you're cracking me up with your hands. <laughs> I know, me too. I would, like, I wish you could have taught all my science classes in school. I think I would have paid a lot more attention. Um, I will say, so in contrast, so Tina's really interested in human evolution for the sake of human evolution. And I think I come at this from the complete opposite end. So for me, when we think about just mammals in general, so mammals, terrestrial mammals, for them to have essentially capitalized on being terrestrial, they needed to evolve hairs. And that means that hair is sort of really important to what it means to be a mammal. I would argue that it's probably the most important trait to mammalian evolution. And we know a lot about the way that hair varies and what genes underlie it in a lot of other systems, except we don't know that much about non-human primates which to me is sort of crazy because primates are the most diverse mammal and they're also that link to humans. If you're gonna ask questions about humans, you know, once you start making comparisons between humans and mice, you're really taking a far jump there. And so the studying non-human primate hair evolution has really been understudied, but it's really important to study it because it can give us some really important insights to potentially how early hominin hair evolved, for example. Um, so I study shafakas, and I think that we have an, an image of them somewhere, but I love shafaks because they are kind of, they're vertical clingers and leapers. And so this means that their heads are kind of always facing the sun. Yeah, there they are. And they're gorgeous. These are just like a few species. So their heads are always facing the sun and their feet are always facing the ground. And so they're one of just a few clades that really mimic human positional behavior in this way. And they also are essentially found all over the islands of Madagascar. So they live in all these eco regions. And so for me, I'm like, what a great sort of system to ask questions about how sort of early hominin diversity hair diversity could have evolved. And it also is, you know, the other side of that for me is just understanding biological diversity, I think is really important and how animals are adapting or failing to adapt to their environments. You know, hair constantly, you know, it's the tissue that constantly regenerates in our body. It's the only one. And so it's very amenable to climate changes and environmental influence. Um, and I think it's potentially a really important window into studying adaptation, especially in species like lemurs that are really, really endangered. So I think that's my two-pronged way that I look at why it's important. No, that makes a lot of sense. And it's so interesting, right? As you and I were sort of talking in advance of this conversation, it was sort of something that I hadn't thought about that as soon as you sort of, you, you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. And one of the things that I thought was really interesting that um, you brought up and I didn't know is that non-human primate infants are often very different colors from yeah. their parents. Yeah, so I think we have a couple pictures of uh, baby infants looking different, but we will have some of these species that essentially have like orange infants, yeah and then really dark adult individuals. And this is something that we don't know anything about. And it fascinates developmental biologists because it's it, developmentally speaking, it's, it's something so strange. How do you go from being one color when you're born and then being another color and sometimes developing patterns at the same time? So that's sort of a really fascinating sort of open-ended question that I think holds a lot of answers. And, the, and it was sort of, again, like talking to Tina, you know, another fact I learned from you is that only humans have tight curls. No primates have tight curls, right? Except for humans. So this is kind of like my, I'll pay a million dollars to whoever proves me wrong question. Um, I put it out there because based on what I know, I have never seen any evidence of another mammal that has really tight curls. So a lot of times when we talk about curls, people think about sheep, but sheep hair isn't curly, it's crimped. Now that might sound like, you know, pedantic, but it actually is important in terms of 
its insulation function and also in terms of its biology. So the thing with crimp is that you kind of get this thing that people call a bilateral wave. And the thing about a bilateral wave is that it doesn't necessarily lose length. So I don't know how many of you were around in like the 90s, you know, early 2000s, back when like those crimp uh, flat irons were a thing, uh, you know, <laughs> made mistakes. My age uh, yearbook is a horrible mistake. <laughs> Um, you know what? It's okay. Uh, history, we learn. But you know what? That's the closest that some people have ever gotten to be sheep. And the cool thing about crimping your hair is that it doesn't necessarily reduce the length as drastically as a curl would. So especially if you have a natural curl, what natural curly haired individuals will tell you is that you have shrinkage. You have this corkscrew effect so if you pull on a clump of curls it'll spring right back and that means that not as many not not as much hair can layer itself um next to each other and if you have a lot of hair layered you know very tightly packed you have a different kind of insulation than something where you have these huge air pockets and it turns out that that's pretty important um in terms of heat transfer now to think of curly haired animals i've i've googled like any scholar i've googled that's what we do um and i have found some pictures of gorillas that look kind of cute mm -hmm. and curly i don't know if somebody permed them it's not something you see often but even so they're not really tight curls and then the closest i've seen is chickens um, and I know those are not mammals. So, you know, I'm lucky that I have Liz here to, you know, keep me in check when it comes to non-human mammals. I know they are not mammals. Wait, uh, how do you see curls and chickens? So they have curly feathers. So they, they do loop. So I don't know what's going on there. Feathers are a whole other, you know, shtick. But uh, in mammals, I haven't seen anything else. And especially when you look at the scale that some of these curls are they are so fine so tiny like these uh curls that have a diameter that's smaller than a pencil and somebody just said poodles um i have a poodle actually isn't it super appropriate for somebody who studies hair to have a poodle i know right <laughs> i didn't do it on purpose um but even my poodle that is not what I would call a curl, it's really this bilateral wave. You have some hairs that kind of look like they're looping all the way around, but it's nothing like what you see in humans. And you can tell because on when you clump a lot of them together, you still have this wave effect versus if you look at people who have really tight curls like myself, you almost can't see the texture at some point because it becomes just this really textured surface which you don't have with poodles or with sheep. And it's interesting, right? Because of course, again, you know, as soon as you said it, it's like so obvious that this is why we're having you come and talk to us. It's sort of like the fact that we're the only sort of mammals as, as far as we know to have curls suggests that there may have been sort of a strong selective pressure for that at some point during our evolution. And that's kind of amazing to think about sort of the reasons um, why that may have been. Um, the other thing that I discovered um, while sort of, you know, sort of talking to you guys in advance of this was that the, the science you use in your research to answer these questions is pretty cool. And it's sort of, you draw on a lot of different disciplines. And I think it would be really interesting to kind of have you, you know, Liz, I know you do a lot with bioinformatics and you know, and also chasing lemurs, you know, on the ground in person. So I'd love for you guys to both talk to us a little bit about sort of like, what does your day to day job entail? Like when you say you're doing science, what does that mean? <laughs> Googling. <laughs> yeah, other than Googling. <laughs> um, yeah, Tina, do you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Um, so besides a lot no actually just a lot of time spent on the computer even if i'm not searching directly literature and signs that other people have done it's probably googling and looking on stack overflow how to code something so i resisted for a very long time learning how to do any programming but it turns out that it really makes a lot of things in your life easier 
And one of the things that it makes easier for me is image analysis. So I have spent way too much of my life trying to measure hair. And that sounds like something you really shouldn't spend that much time doing, right? Like that's not even the question. That's not the question. That's the tool that you use to answer the question. But a funny thing is that it turns out that a lot of science means that somebody has got to be the schmuck who dedicates their career to creating the tools to actually answer the questions. So I think we have a slide somewhere here um, talking about two different aspects of hair morphology that I measure. So if you think about the strands of hair on your head, you can think about their cross-sectional shape and you can talk, talk about their curvature as well. So in terms of cross-sectional shape, that involves you having to embed the hair in something. So traditionally, this is something that was done in uh, resin. And that is something that takes a really long time, like at least 24 hours for it to uh, dry and then you have to use a lot of specialized tools to actually cut it and uh, if you are dealing with curly hairs and you are trying to get a straight cross section good luck trying to hold that hair straight for 24 hours while it's drying in resin it can be done I've done it but it's not fun so I spent a lot of time developing new methods to do that more easily in plastic basically and so one of the things that you can see when you section a hair under a microscope is its cross-sectional shape and we usually talk about it being relatively circular or relatively elliptical. Um, and you can also talk about the area. So when people say that they have thick hair, they usually talk about two different things. Um, they could be talking about them having a dense head of hair. That's one thing. Or you can have individually thick hair fibers. And that's something that is very distinct among different uh, populations. There are a lot of East Asian and Native American populations that have especially incredibly thick hair fibers. Um, and then with curvature, that has been the thing that was the bane of my existence for like the last eight years. It's figuring out how to measure this. When we talk about curl, if you will go and reach into your memories, you might notice that nowhere there do you have a tool for actually measuring it. And most scientists have kind of been working with that limitation with just categorizing hair. Like you will say some people have straight hair, wavy hair, curly hair, kinky hair if you're feeling diverse that day. Um, but how do you actually measure this variation? Because if you think about it, if you think about height, for example, why would you categorize people as short, medium, and tall when you could actually measure how tall they are? Well, turns out that um, if you don't have the tools, it's really hard. But now that we do, um, I've actually found that it really does make a difference. So there are a lot of correlations that you can see when you're able to actually put a number to something. And hair morphology is something that we consider to be a complex trait. And that really is shorthand for we think it, that there are a lot of genes involved in this. And when there are a lot of genes involved in something, you are able to create a biological phenotype with this beautiful continuous range of variation. And if you have a beautiful continuous range of variation, you need to be able to really look at the like high resolution fine differences so you can find if there are any associations between people who have particular genotypes and having more or less curly hair or thicker or thinner hair. Well, it's so interesting to kind of hear about this and sort of, yeah, again, how do you kind of quantify something that is sort of, for so many of us is considered like descriptive, you know, but you're talking about like, how do you straighten out the hair samples and you need actual hair samples kind of makes me wonder, okay, you get a hair from somebody's head. I don't know if you cut it or you pluck it or what, but like, how do you get a primate hair sample? Good question, Liz. <laughs> Liz, like, do you have to chase them around with a pair of scissors or like, what do you do? <laughs> um, so what, what we've done is that we've, we've plucked live animals. <laughs> um, they, they're, they go back to living their happy lives. Um, so you can do this with zoo animals or you can do this. So my long-term collaborators in Madagascar, they have a um, site where they return to over and over again for the past 20 years. And they have been um, darting Shafox for monitoring their health 
and also radio collaring them since they live in an unprotected forest. And I sort of jumped on their band bandwagon and I was like, you're doing this really important conservation work. Can I just come and pluck your lemurs? <laughs> and he was just like, this is so weird, but fine. And he, he's fantastic. And so I, I go out with him um, to Madagascar sometimes and I join sort of the capture team and yeah, we'll just take like a tuft with gloves and you pluck and then you can put that tuft in like a buffer and that can maintain sort of the RNA and the DNA so that then you can look at that later in the lab. But yeah, just plucking. Plucking, is it silky or is it like more bristly? It's because it's very interesting just what Tina was saying makes me think kind of, you know, you think about our hair texture, but sort of like, what is it like to pet so a lemur? Vary, which is kind of interesting. It's when So when you're touching them, they vary. And for some of them, they're silky and they're dense. And you're like, this is beautiful. I could touch this coat all day long. It's like a fluffy, like a fluffy cat or like a fluffy dog. And you just want to cuddle up in them. But some of them have just like really like short hairs, very fine hairs. And it's <laughs> like, what's <laughs> anything? So yeah, they could use some moose. There, similar, very similar to humans. They don't have curls. I, I admit <laughs> they don't have curls. <laughs> I'm just sort of, I feel like we're moving. This time isn't really long enough for us to kind of have, like I could talk about this for like another hour, but I'm sort of, you know, and looking to make sure we have time for questions. You know, one thing that, um, became really clear to me when we were talking and something I think it's really important to touch upon now and especially talking about characterization of hair and so on you know when we first discussed this field you both pointed out that there's been a lot of it's been influenced you know to its detriment by kind of racial and gender bias and I think it would be really helpful to kind of for you to both to talk a little bit about this and sort of like why is it so important to correct the record. I mean, I know this is not the area of science that is, you know, <laughs> negatively impacted by that, but it seems like this is particularly so. So I'd love you guys to talk about that a little bit, I think. Yeah, a lot of the work that I do, a lot of the writing that I do and talking about this really interfaces with this because I deal directly with human variation. And this is something that from day minus 200 uh, <laughs> was used to identify people, distinguish people, whatever you want to say. Uh, I hate to be that person bringing in the ancient Greeks, but Herodotus, um, our ancient Greek homie, he was one of the first to um, discuss, you know, these differences in the sense that if you look at some of the writing that he did, he talks about Ethiopians having woolly hair. And you'll notice that, you know, especially one of the things that I like to rectify is this idea that individuals of African descent and their hair is anything at all comparable to wool. So this whole dehumanization of people by comparing their hair to animal hair is actually very common. And it's not just, um, not just restricted to uh, African peoples. So you think about um, woolly hair, for example, and some people are like, well, yeah, like, you know, it's, it's similar to that like when what's the problem what's what's really the difference we're just comparing the morphology well the indigenous people of scandinavia sami people when you look at some of the anthropology that they had to endure their hair was compared to horse hair they have straight hair so like you really can't win it's not about you being more animal like or human like it's about who is trying to reduce you to a subhuman state and that's really, you know, the issue here. And there's so many things to, to rectify. Um, one of them being that there isn't a difference fundamentally between hair and fur. So this is um, a huge miscommunication that a lot of people talk about all the time. And even within dogs, like I've had people tell me, well, some dogs have fur and other dogs have hair. And the hair is fur, fur is hair. It's just a way that humans have to make themselves special by reserving a term that is just for us. And that's really what hair is. Um, and looking at 
you know, the way that we try to distinguish different, different humans, like that can have a lot of consequences. So a lot of what my concern is and what I try to um, inform people about is the way that this is used in forensics. Now, forensics has the difficult task of trying to identify individuals based off of not a whole individual. So they will tend to use whatever they can get. And one of the forms of trace evidence that they use is hair. Unfortunately, hair is something that is even really variable within one individual's scalp. If you look at the hair on my edges, it is super straight and super short. And then you have the hair that's on the rest of my scalp, it will be variably curly. So depending on what hair you find, are you gonna decide that I'm racially, I don't know, Asian or Caucasian, whatever that means, or African? And then on top of that, you have the fact that humans can't really be divided into these pure races. And that's something that you know keeps going on, especially when we, in our everyday language, discuss hair and talk about Caucasian hair, African hair, Asian hair, that really reinforces these things. I think, you know, just, you know, before we move on, Liz, there was something that sort of you pointed out, right, is that I think that sometimes we think of like science as absolute, right? Like it's scientifically validated, so it must be true, but kind of one of the things that really resonated with me is the fact that kind of everybody comes to science with their own biases, whether they are aware of them or not. And you know, I think I would love for you to just talk a little bit about that and why, you know, it's so exciting. And one of the reasons why we really want to, you know, it's exciting to talk to two women who are like under 50 and, you know, like, I, you know, they it just sort of what the advantages are of sort of like diversifying um, STEM and in particular sort of the, the scientists that are studying human evolution. Yeah, so, you know, I will say to, to continue Tina's thought, or Tina's explanation, we see a lot of these, I mean, they're not, um, not to the extent that you see in humans, but you do see like in animals associations or people looking for associations between like black coat color and behavioral traits such as aggressiveness. And at the end of the day, I think that you kind of need to go back to like, who were like the pioneers of these fields and Although we have learned a lot from them, they are all, or most of them have been white men. And that influences, whether they wanted it to influence them or not, it did influence what they saw, what they recorded, what they thought was important variation and how they sort of described it. And this has sort of molded the field and like pushed these theories and hypotheses that were biased because we only had sort of one viewpoint as to what hypotheses could be going on. And so I think it's important for somebody like Tina to be studying human hair evolution, for somebody like me to be studying sort of non-human primate evolution, try to change these conversations and consider maybe some different hypotheses that are maybe a little bit outside the wheelhouse that have not been considered before because you just don't have that many diverse scientists. And so I think it is important to center voices of um, the Latinx community, of the Black community, and especially when those identities intersect with sort of the LGBTQ community. You know, there's so many underrepresented groups that don't have their voices in these sort of large hypotheses that have been um, excluded. Okay, well, we're going to turn to questions now. I mean, I would love to keep talking more about this, but these questions are like coming in faster than I can read them. So I was like, I hope you guys are ready. So um, okay, so I'm just gonna, I wish, first of all, it's amazing. Everybody was clearly listening. Like these questions are really cool and thoughtful and sort of like critical. And that is really rewarding. Um, so I'm just going to throw these out and either or both of you can answer as you feel moved. And these are just at random if I don't get to your question. I'm sorry. It's just, you know, the order in which they are and sort of like what's on my screen. So the first question that appeared and I kind of think is interesting is from Janet. Um, and she said, our hominid ancestors had much more body hair than modern humans. Will modern humans eventually become hairless? I mean, this question it comes up a lot in like evolutionary settings. It's like, 
you know, predict what humans are going to be like. And that is just something that we can't do. Um, basically, to answer that question, you could essentially ask, you know, a couple of questions. And one of those would be, do we expect selection to play a role? So are we somehow going to eugenics out anyone with any hair? I really doubt it. I really hope not. We yeah, never right? Um, <laughs> but if that doesn't happen, really evolutionarily, all that matters is who has babies. So if people with hair have babies who have hair, humans will keep having hair. And I, for one, based on the information I currently have, think that that will be the case. So unless there's some huge, you know, the day after tomorrow, Independence Day, I don't know what aliens are going to come for us and exclude everyone who's hairy, I think we're good. And I will say terrestrial mammals have hair and we need hair. I think it's only like the mole that lives underground. So hey, we're hairy. We're staying it hairy. <laughs> Okay, well, I think that's a great argument for me. I'm not going to shave my legs anymore. You know what we need? We need body hair. And there's a reason that we have it. Um, okay, so this is another interesting question that comes from Aaron, which is like, obviously within humans, there's a lot of different, as a species, there's a lot of different variety of hair, um, hair types, colors, whatever, you know, so it, it's, is there the similar variation intraspecies in other species? Yeah, you mean in, yeah, so there's a lot of variation in pigmentation and hair density, both within species and even within populations. So oh, really? Species, yeah. So the population that I work with, where I go and I pluck their hairs, they're really fascinating because they're sort of one population of one species, but in sort of different regions of the park, they'll, they look differently. So in one region, they're darker, and in the other region, they're lighter, and in one region, they're hairier, and in the other region, they're less hairy. So there's a lot of variation, and we also see variation across their bodies. So the, their hair density on their head, for example, Tina and I sort of geek about this, because like their hair density is so high on their heads, and it's the highest on their heads very similar to humans, and it does sort of vary throughout their bodies. So the, the long answer is what I just said. And the short answer is, yes, there's, there's a lot of variation, a lot that has gone undocumented. Okay, that's fascinating. I, okay, we're gonna move on to another question. It's like, it's so hard because I'm like, but wait. <laughs> I have questions, um, I have questions. I have to stop myself. <laughs> I know, right? Um, so I'm looking and seeing what else. Again, I don't know if you guys will necessarily have answers for this, but it's sort of interesting, right? Eve asks, you know, if hair on top of the head has, you know, a role in thermal regulation and we've sort of selectively selected to evolve that as humans, you know, why does baldness persist genetically? And I guess, do we see the same thing in non-human species? Like, are there primates that bald? <laughs> no, there are no I bald primates, but I do think Tina should take this question. <laughs> okay. Oh, ooh, wait, what about those ones? Oh my God, I'm going to really- It's like the bald Kari, I guess, but I yeah, mean, that. It's, bald. it's not like periodic baldness. It's no. just like, that's its phenotype. That's like, like. Was, now I wish we had a photo of it. But yeah, I know, I was like, there, so there's no lemurs out there with like comb overs. I mean, like. everyone can just Google for themselves bald primate and you will see yeah, it. It has like Kari. a red head and whatever. Um, but in any case, when it comes to humans, I, I just feel like I'm bringing everyone all this negative news. The cold hard truth is if you already had kids or could have had kids, evolution doesn't care about you. If this is happening to you post reproductively, evolution does not care about you. So basically, unless there's a reason that we could believe that we needed to protect post reproductive individuals who are prone to balding, it is unlikely that selection would have affected them. So a lot of a uh, human, a lot of human question or a lot of questions about humans post reproduction are interesting because really it, it's kind of like a, you know what, do what you want after you've had kids with the exception of grandmothers potentially um, having played a, a particular role. 
but also an important factor to take into consideration is that there might have been a very particular time in human evolution when scalp hair was important. It doesn't look like, based off of what I've seen, this is something that would have been even recently important. It might have been that, you know, in early Homo erectus or in late Australopiths or maybe early Australopiths, that it was really important. And then afterwards, once we had evolved it, we were able to have these big brains come up with like a better solution so that we could keep the baldies in our lives safe. <laughs> okay, sorry. Okay, I think we have time for one more question and only one, unfortunately. Sorry, I'm, I'm still listening. I'm just seeing all these questions pour in and I'm like, oh, that's a really good one. Um, okay, so one, I guess the last question, because I think that this could apply to both humans and primates, is sort of, is there any relationship between the thickness and amount of someone's hair or a primate's hair and the kind of the general health hmm. of that person or primate? Because, I mean, I think, and just, you know, again, to sort of, maybe this brings up again, Liz, you were saying that kind of like, there's so many things you don't know that affect hair, such as hormones and nutrition and all of these things. But I'd love to hear your guys kind of take on what you've observed or know about this. So I don't know of any hypotheses that tie sort of immunity or health to hair growth. Maybe there is in humans. I do know um, in primates or in mammals in general, there is the idea that you know, potentially a certain phenotype, certain color morphs, for example, might have better immunity. And the, the idea is that this might occur via a selection on a different trait. So selection could be acting, for example, on cold tolerance or immunity, and it might sort of pull along this other trait, for example, black hair. So I do know that there's that hypothesis out there when it comes to sort of mammalian hair and health, but I don't know anything about about growth. I don't think there's anything in something that's not a human. Tina, so know. in humans, so this this is a comp complicated question because um, as Liz kind of touched on uh, a little bit earlier, your hair is con it's like this mini organ that's constantly regenerating. And one of the things that you can do with hair that some people might be familiar with is drug testing, but also you can get a, a read on some new, like on, on some nutrition factors through your hair. And that's because you have this supply of blood that's constantly infusing it with these byproducts from what's in your, uh, in your body, what, doesn't necessarily have to do with hair growth. And that means that there are a lot of things that might be coursing through your veins and affecting your hair follicles or maybe damaging them in some ways. In humans and in a lot of biology, when it comes to health, there are very easy extremes. So in cases of starvation or malnutrition, it can be that humans experience hair thinning, that they experience hair loss. Um, even in very kind of regular health events for some individuals like pregnancy, um, you will potentially experience this sort of synchronization of the hair cycle. That means that all of a sudden you lose all your hair, I think, post-pregnancy. And there's even weirder occurrences like, um, I think one form of malnutrition, um, Quashiorcor, like a protein malnutrition, where you can get, or individuals who don't have red hair can have their hair turn red. So there's a lot of weird things that can occur because there's just a lot of chemistry and biology that's constantly ongoing in your hair. It's not something like um, your bones or your brain that is formed over a super long period of time and tends to stay. It's something that's constantly renewing and you probably won't have the same head of hair seven years from now as you do now. So that's really what I can think of. I mean, I think that in a way that's kind of, I didn't plan it this way, but I think that's a great question to end on because that is sort of a really, if we had to kind of be reductive and be like, why should we care about hair? Like that's one really interesting answer. I sort of never thought about it that 
way, but yeah, it's sort of like a record of our environment and who we are and then so many other different things. And I can't believe it's already six o'clock. Like how, how did that happen? I'm just sad. I, well, I'll make sure you guys get the questions after this anyway, because I think you would find them very interesting. <laughs> But I feel like it's time, unfortunately, for me to um, mute myself and hand things back to Rhea. So um, I just want to say selfishly, thank you so much for letting me be a part of this conversation and for your time in talking to us and educating us today and for being so honest um, in the sort of the science, you know, sort of like your, that's my timer, you know, just being sort of so forthright and dealing with our questions and, you know, explaining to us like we're fine. <laughs> yeah, excellent. And I would also like to echo that gratitude. Thank you so much, all three of you. What an exciting way to end the evening. Um, if you are interested in signing up for any additional hot topics, such as the one you heard about today, the Leaky Foundation website is your place to be. So on this website, you'll find a bunch of other cool programming, such as Lunch Break Science, which periodically happens um, right around your lunch break. So take a little step away from work um, and check out things like the next one will be about gelada, which is a type of primate behavior in the Ethiopian highlands. Wait, um, for a second, I thought you said gelato. When I was like, yeah, wait, yeah. What? <laughs> lemon or, so, or, you know, raspberry sorbets in the Ethiopia. Um, they also have incredible programs. If you would like to listen to a podcast on your next walk, um, check out Origin Stories. It's another great way to get some more information about human evolution. And of course, if you're interested, sign up with our young professional group so you can join us for additional events like this in the future. So welcome everyone to the YPG. We hope you stick around via our listserv. Uh, we'll be sending a follow-up email with some of these details. And of course, a link to donate if you would like your mustache mask or your hairbender coffee. Now that you have all of these exciting tidbits of information to share about hair. Thanks so much.